Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with creative director Ed Collins, Nick Ace. If you've been around the show for a while, you may recall that name, Collins. We interviewed his boss and the founder of Collins, Brian Collins, twice back in 2016. So if you've not listened to those episodes yet, we will definitely include links to those shows over at obsessedshow.com. Welcome to season four of Obsessed Show. You'll note that we are no longer calling it Obsessed with Design. This season, we'll still be chatting with designers from branding, illustration, architecture, and design thinking, but we'll also be talking to other makers and creatives along the way. In fact, when we started the show, the plan all along was to broaden out and talk to other guests eventually, which was part of why our website and Twitter handle and Instagram are all Obsessed Show. If you're into what we're doing here, you might also want to check out my personal branding and marketing tips called 59 Second Friday. That's over at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. That's enough about season four. Let's talk about today's episode. If you listen to episode number 113 with Mark Hirons, you also know I've been experimenting with a few different tools to record both video and audio. The good news is the video on this one is really fun and it's over at youtube.com slash Josh Miles and gives you a few visuals that you may not pick up on in just the podcast itself. The audio is still not fantastic, but I promise we'll get this figured out. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Nick Ace. Here is Nick Ace. Nick describes himself as brand exorcist. We'll dig into that more <laughs> shortly. His work has been featured in uh, business culture and style media, including Forbes, Fast Company, Vice, Pitchfork, Refinery29, and De- Design Observer, among others. Nick, welcome to Obsessed with Design. Hello, Josh. Nice to see you. Yes. Great to make this happen. How you, you been today? I'm pretty good. You know, we're in the middle of the work day. It's about 430 over here. Where are you anyways? I'm actually in Indianapolis. Oh, wow. I love that city. Oh, have you been here? Uh, Twice for work, but um, not at liberty to go beyond. (laughs) Okay. Not good. Good. You went to Ryan in 2016? Yeah, it was. uh, I actually um, saw him at uh the AIGA gain conference back in oh, I don't know gosh 2004 or something so mm-hmm. had a really early connection with him but uh, uh a, a client that we both had in common very early in each of our careers uh, said hey you should talk to Brian Collins sometime you ever heard of this guy and I was like oh yeah I saw him present he did the whole pirate flag uh, thing oh, I love that one yeah <laughs> I love that story so anyhow Brian was awesome and uh he even busted out his uh, his puppet for us, the little Brian. <laughs> nice. Yeah, he's a wonderful man. So I am uh, curious to hear more about all of your exciting escapades at Collins. But first, I always like to start with uh, your origin story. So tell us how you found your way into this world of creativity and advertising. Yeah. Do, do you have a minute? Because really, I could abridge this. I could. Yes, sir. You just you just give it to us. Okay, so uh, from about 14 to, I would say, 23, I played in uh, hardcore bands and metal bands. And I was playing all over the coast, touring from Albany down to Miami and back. Uh, By the time I was 17, fresh out of high school, my mom uh, didn't want... uh, How can I put this softly? Um, My mom saw perhaps another path for me. (laughs) Um, And at that point, I didn't know what graphic design was, but I had been making posters, flyers, t-shirts, record covers, everything for my bands. Uh, I had developed a bit of a reputation for that in the area I grew up in. I knew all the bands, I booked shows, actually worked as a recording engineer. And my mom took all my artwork and brought it to a college, a local college, And the next day was like, congratulations, you got a scholarship for graphic design. Um, 
and I think my first class was a was a nude drawing class. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think it took me a couple of weeks to figure out what graphic design was, but I I had been doing it anyways. Um, playing in bands, I landed a job at Equal Vision Records before I finished college. So I think I was like twenty or twenty one. Mm-hmm. All their T-shirts, record covers, ad mats. I had a friend who was an art director there. Um, my goodness. Then to close out my undergrad, you have to do like your big project. They call it a capstone or a thesis. And I did a campaign to inspire um, good manners, albeit subjective. Caught the eye of some local press, got a lot of coverage. Then I got offered to teach elementary school, teaching etiquette to children uh, through uh, typographic posters was the way the class ended up. Um, That got me on some other radar, uh, eventually got accepted to the SVA MFA design department uh, Mm -hmm. from Steve Heller and a recommendation from a teacher. That's where I met Brian. While I was at SVA, I took a job at Matador Records, working with everybody from Lou Reed to Pavement to Cat Power. Um, And then, my goodness, so now we're in like, I think I started in 2000, 2001. Now we're in 2008. Stop me if this is boring you. I'm finding every urge not to swear and make fun of myself. (laughs) Um, Sorry, Josh, you must understand, I am uh, typically not this person. I like being a shadow person. Um, I like making the work. And when these guys said, hey, we want you to speak to Josh Miles, I listen to your podcast. I'm like, okay, this guy doesn't sound fake. Um, So, so, um, Mission accomplished. Yeah, so typically I'm very... um, uh, awkward about describing these things but anyways yeah so then we're at sva mfa design uh get a job at matador doing a bunch of work for them um i got out of sva and it was in the middle of the recession so this is 08 to 09 and i went to a book release party that went quite late met some guys there they said what are you doing it was like three in the morning said, oh, I have to go home and make a logo. I, I had been uh, doing some freelance work when I got out of school. And they said, you know, oh, you're working at four in the morning. Do you want to come work for us? Um, and that was Frank. <laughs> uh, Frank uh, is a, I guess now I would describe it maybe a little bit differently than when I started. Um, it's a very like hip hop, street lifestyle, quarterly publication. Uh, worked there for four years. Uh, became the creative director, collaborated with everybody you can imagine from the ASAP mob to MF Doom, uh, to the Wu-Tang Clan. My goodness. Then, sorry, nobody ever asked me this question and it's been such a long life, Josh. Um, then, uh, they moved me out to LA to work on some collaborations with Toyota, which was doing some big art and music programs at the time. It's a natural segue from Wu-Tang to Toyota, right? <laughs> uh, you would be surprised. I mean, uh, the woman who led Toyota Scion's marketing initiatives from, I want to say like 2005 to 2015, was mm-hmm. a woman, Jerry Yoshizu, who was truly a visionary. She was the one, even before Red Bull or Converse or any of that stuff, she was like, hey, we're spending you know, X amount of money on keychains this year and stickers and brochures. She's like, I could take this money and put bands on tour. Mm. I could do art shows. I could do music videos. And I, you know, you're always leery about those things going in. And I swear I'll finish my design career in a minute. Um, I remember speaking to, we were doing like a research assignment and, you know, they would ask people at dealerships, how did you hear about this car? And people would be like, oh, I went to see Obituary, uh, which is a <laughs> metal band. Um, so it works, you know, and she was a real visionary when it came to that. And I partnered with her and Frank, obviously, when I was out in L.A. Anyhow, so then um, I think I was about six months living in L.A. I hadn't even changed my driver's license. And... 
LA is an amazing city, but I was so bored and I felt like I had done everything a young man could possibly do in LA in six months. Um, so I cold called Brian, whose class I took in 2009, hmm. uh, 2008, I think 2000. And, um, he picked up right away. I was in a parking lot in West Hollywood and he said, Nick Ace, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm living in LA. I'm working on some short documentaries. I'm creative directing a magazine. He's like, you still doing design? I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and, and I said, look, uh, I kind of want to change my career. I don't know if there's any jobs in the paper. Up until that point, I think every job I had gotten professionally was in the newspaper, which I kind of <laughs> myself a little bit much different world now. Um, so it's Brian. So he was like, he was like, what are you doing on Saturday? And I said, <laughs> I don't know, I'm probably working. And he was like, fly to New York and I'll help you figure out your life. Um, so that's what I did. I flew right to New York. I was pretty broke at the time, but I knew it was worth it. Brian's a player. He's a true player. Um, so I decided to go meet with him and he said, come back in a month or two and I'll have a job for you. Your job title will be Nick Ace. Um, I think at the time there was about five, maybe six people working at Collins and that's how I started working at Collins. I think like three months later, um, immediately. Um, and again, I have to table this for a moment, Josh, because you seem like such a wonderful man. And I've spent 10 minutes talking about myself. It is maddening. Um, he had asked me because I had been directing a lot of music videos. I had been doing some interactive projects. He was like, why don't you do a project like that for us? And I think I was about a month in at Collins. It's like January, 2014. And I was like, did I leave my cool hip hop job to work on like big box department stores? Uh, and I, I kind of had a, a freak out moment. If he wants to edit this out, he probably will. Um, no names dropped. Um, and at the time I was doing a lot of videos for a young woman named Bazilia Banks who had stirred up a lot of controversy on TV and online. Um, we were great friends. I wrote a treatment for her that would be the world's uh, first face controlled music video. I told Brian, I was like, let's do this. You know, I'm doing music videos with this woman anyways. I think this is a great time to leverage some of our interactive capabilities. And Google Cloud caught wind of it uh, maybe six months later once it was uh, a prototype. And they offered to sponsor our project. And then uh, they pretty much put us on the map on a lot of strange channels that Collins would never appear on. Um, yeah. And goodness that came out four years ago next month. Yeah. That's amazing. So, mm. um, when I would have talked to Brian last, you were just kind of getting up to speed over at Collins. So that's a yeah, interesting little dovetail. Five years or so. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm kind of a branding guy first and foremost. So when I saw your note that you were a brand exorcist, mm. you have to fill me in on, on what that means or how you define that. You know, what's funny is, um, well, thank you for asking me that. Um, people do ask me about that all the time. It's like on LinkedIn, I see so many made up job titles. I'm like, <laughs> whatever, it's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to dog anybody for their particular job title right now, but I was like, what do I actually do? Right. And I think often at the start of working with a brand in your discovery and research phase, you're trying to learn and understand what, what's great about that brand. Uh, where, where do their customers see them? Mm -hmm. What is the light their customers don't want to see them in? Um, where do their customers feel like they lost the plot or they lost the trust? So brand extra brand exorcist is a bit of a piss take. You know, it's saying that I'm looking to get rid of the poisonous elements of your brand and really make you shine for the people who love you. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. I think it's yeah, pretty clear. Yeah. yeah, no, I think it's so easy for companies to kind of get 
get caught up in just doing business that they don't, they don't even pay attention to that stuff. So it's, it's so much easier to have somebody from the outside look in at them and say, Hey, Hey, here's what people are seeing or saying. And I think that's a, that's a novel take on it. Yeah. And I mean, again, it's like, it is, I do genuinely feel that way. And it's a nice filter by which to judge my role in the situation often. Um, potentially as a lifelong fan of the macabre and of course <laughs> the <laughs> exorcist wearing black um goes with the hardcore music and all that <laughs> sure yeah there's always uh maybe we listen to lighter things nowadays <laughs> okay slightly um what did you play in the band uh, i played drums drums yes yeah. nice. mm-hmm. very cool i fancy myself a drummer but it's mostly just on the steering wheel you know, if you can do it on the steering wheel, if we ever meet up in Indy or um, or you're in New York, I can teach you how to play drums in like an hour. You're on. Uh, <laughs> this is happening. Um, so going back to the 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 macabre and the brand exorcist thing. So <laughs> I was stalking you a bit on on the the Instagram, and there are lots of photos of you with with people that are sort of ghosted out, or you're ghosted out of the photo. What's the? Mm-hmm. Tell me about this. Oh, it's always me um who's ghosted out um you know that was i think i kicked off that project around the time i started at collins in december 13 and um i had noticed you know at that point we're maybe three years into instagram or something like Mm -hmm. that everybody i knew was on it and between dating pictures with friends things like that I would find that people I didn't really know were having conversations with me. So for example, someone might have seen you in a photo with somebody else and they're like, you know, they come up to you in public. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but I, it, it wasn't that that made me feel any type of way. I just had fully identified that, people were having conversations with me when I wasn't there. Uh, I remember a friend <laughs> commenting on a, another friend's Instagram while we were all together and been like, Oh, you get chicken sandwiches there. And I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> why would you know that? <laughs> yeah. But it's like, because we're consuming what each other are putting out there. So I said, yeah. what is a way to acknowledge that I'm both here, but not really here that you're just, um, potentially having a conversation with a faint image of me or just mm-hmm. a piece. And I had become obsessed with uh, spirit photography from the late 19th century. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like oh, that, yeah. but you know, there was claims back then people really believed in magic and the occult, not to say they don't now, but at mass consciousness, people thought, well, this house is haunted. This church is haunted. Yeah. And other people would do overlay um, film transparencies and show that there was a ghost. And who could debunk that back then? It's a photo. It's real. (laughs) Uh, So I started doing those. And then I started doing videos for it. And then every photographer, um, every friend was like, can I please get a spirit photo with you? And now I have, I think I have like 600 different ones in five. Yeah, there were a lot. It was, it was many, <laughs> many, many swipes. I was like, no, th- he's committed to this. This has been That's going funny. on for a long time. Yeah, one of our <laughs> clients said that to me recently. They're like, you are so consistently a ghost. You know what's funny? Um, <laughs> occasionally, sort of to spin it back full circle. Do you like that? Full circle. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's all right. You know, cooking it up. Um <laughs> is um, I'll meet people that have maybe followed me online or, you know, were introduced through friends and they'll literally, occasionally somebody will touch me to see if I'm real. (laughs) Which is, you know, I think it's a massive compliment. Hold up the mirror, see if you make a reflection. (laughs) Yeah, my wife asked me recently, she's like, when are you going to stop posting ghost photos? I was like, honestly, it's been five years. I think I could stretch this out like another 50. (laughs) Why stop now? What's the point? (laughs) So the other thing I saw on on Instagram were the Nick Ace stickers. Oh, yeah. Or badges or something. I wasn't sure what those were. When, When does that get started? 
Oh yeah. So I think that's around the same time too. I, um, I took my portfolio down a long time ago because of, um, oh my goodness. Uh, this is a funny story. We're going to go very off track, John. Mm, yeah. That's the best place to go. <laughs> we need to speak about Collins because, um, <laughs> that's where I work. Um, oh, we'll get there for sure. Okay. So, um, I interviewed somebody a number of years ago and I, again, this is in the same atmosphere of the spirit photography. And when they showed me their portfolio, they showed me my own work. Um, the chances of that happening in New York city have to be pretty slim, Yeah, but it wasn't just the design. It was photographs that I took in my old apartment. You know, you can see my thumb and it wasn't a good photograph. Um, So I said to this candidate, I was like, I I have to stop you right there. You you just showed me my own design work. And they were so embarrassed. um, I was like, look, the chances of this happening are so slim to none, but this interview is over. And they said, why? And I was like, well, based on the very close proximity, of potentially everything you're showing me is somebody else's work. How else could I judge that at that point? Um, wow. So anyways, you know, a lot of people don't post portfolios or do private links or something like that. Um, that was what made me take my portfolio down. So I was like, how else can I drum up work? Um, Cause I always had a lot of freelance assignments and mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of people working playing in bands and stuff for a long time. So um, I called Sticker Guy. Um, Sticker Guy has been an ad in the back of Maximum Rock and Roll, which has been a publication for many years. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, I called them and said I needed um, Nick Ace sentence case um, in Helvetica 75 bold. you know, in whatever size I think I spec'd out at the time. And I wanted to, I wanted to phone it in because I didn't want to design a logo for myself. I mm. thought it would be really funny to just phone in uh, <laughs> my design. And I think I started with like three or 4,000 stickers, something like that. And I gave them to every friend, every scumbag I knew, <laughs> every, <laughs> um, I had a bunch of buddies with record labels that would include them in the kits. Um, so like you would order a vinyl or you know, t-shirt or something and it would come with like all the band stickers and it would come with one of my stickers. I had a bunch of friends who were touring musicians that put it on all their gear. So they were on their road cases, on their drum kits. And basically what started happening was if you were in New York or LA or London um, and you walked by one of my stickers, somebody would say, who the F is Nick Ace and chances are somebody would be like, Oh, I know that guy. He did a logo (laughs) video for me or, um, Oh, I met him at a party. Here's his number. Right. Um, and it worked. Um, just having those stickers. I mean, God, I built so much money off of (laughs) having those stickers out in the world. And then Veronique Vienne did a profile in Design Observer because um, I knew her a little bit. She had spotted the sticker. She thought it was an interesting way to get business. And then, I mean, maybe like 20,000 stickers later, I got arrested in New York. Um, had to spend, it wasn't bad. It was like 48 hours in a cell um, for putting up stickers. Then I went to represent myself in court as I watch a lot of Law and Order, and I fancy myself a, not definitely not a lawyer, but I know a couple terms. Maybe as they relate to the Special Victims Unit, right. bigger crimes. Um, so, um, hey, look, I can quote Ice T. I know what I know what he says. Yeah, you know, he's one of the greatest actors, and what a franchise. Mariska Hargitay is a showstopper so um anyway so when i went to represent myself in court um they had me down for criminal vandalism and possession of graffiti materials and a pd a public defender uh came to find me and she was like 
um, uh, she was like, criminal vandalism. And I was like, yeah, I was putting up some stickers. And, <laughs> and she was like, okay, well, you have a tag name. Like, are you a graffiti writer? Um, who's Nick Ace? Is that your tag name? I'm like, no, that's my name. I'm an artist. And she said, she's like, well, can you prove that to the judge? And I just, I pulled up an article in Forbes. I pulled up an article in Fast Company, uh, New York Times. And they were like, okay, yeah, you really do this. Um, <laughs> I think I, I was on probation for a year, meaning like I couldn't put up stickers anywhere. Thirties. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, <laughs> and I think I paid 50 bucks, something like that. No lawyer, not bad. Nice. I Very didn't know long. you could spend two nights in the slammer for, uh, for stickers, but well, it fell on a weekend and it was like the middle of the night when I was caught putting oh. up on a pole. So mm -hmm. there was nobody to process, uh, my paperwork. So I had to just, it's not like, I'm not going to sit here and be like, yeah, I did time. <laughs> It was like this, you know, like 140 pound petite brunette in a holding cell in the Lower East Side, you know, not, not hard. <laughs> you know, I didn't get any tattoos while I was in there. Well, how's this for a segue? Speaking of your time in the cell, <laughs> uh -huh. no, let's, let's talk about what it's like working at Collins. Oh my goodness. Yeah, of course. I mean, Brian from from my few interactions with him is is quite the character got to be an amazing guy to work with but i would take a about, bullet from that man yeah yeah come at me <laughs> bring it no uh brian is a wonderful man and i mean he's really um he's built this place entirely under his dreams that under the under the idea of what his dream studio would be um, I have so many nice things uh, to say about this as I've been here for five years. I think the best thing would be because I need to hear you speak, Josh. I am so goddamn sick of the sound of my own voice. <laughs> you should ask me some questions and I'll tell you why I work here, why I love working here. That's probably the best way. Otherwise, I could go on for hours. All right. So let's yeah. do that. Um Maybe we'll jump into a project specifically and we'll maybe we'll uncover some Collins-ness about it. But uh, I understand that you worked on the the recent uh, rebrand for Chubb, which was a uh -huh. brand that I was completely unfamiliar with before I saw the links. But man, there is some gorgeous work going on there. I love the the video treatments and identity, just sort of the, the unex it's, it was unexpected to me how high end that brand felt for, for what they do. So maybe tell our listeners a little bit about how that came to be. Yeah. So, um, the Chubb visual identity and strategy was led by William Charnox, Hayden Lockerbie, Brian Collins, and Tom Wilder over at our team. Um, Tom and Brian asked me to get involved with uh, some video creation that Chubb had requested. Um, and how did it all begin? Um, they had asked us to do profiles of insurance agents, mm -hmm. uh, sitting in their offices, explaining what they do for capabilities, very common ask. And as I was reading about their jobs and was looking at the budgets, this is even before the advertising. Um, I said, you guys, you insure like billion dollar vineyards and Broadway theaters mm -hmm. and some of the most awe-inspiring homes you've ever seen in New York City. You, you insure uh, the New York Public Library, One World Trade. So I said, why don't we just shoot very candid interviews um, with your agents in the spaces they insure? And I think in that first wave we did a luxury home, a Broadway theater. We booked a ballerina for it. It was glorious. Um, and a billion dollar vineyard out in Napa. Um, based on that work, uh, they asked, well, that work and obviously all the work leading up to it. Um, 
they asked us to rethink their advertising. Traditionally, Chubb had worked with advertising agencies, um, whether that was Ace or Chubb, or obviously since the merger. And it was, at that time, it was very rare that one of our clients would have asked us to do their advertising. A lot mm -hmm. of people see us as a design company or a strategy and design company. Oh, they'll do your identity. You should see their packaging. But um, personally, at least three years in at that point, um, I had executed maybe four or five different campaigns for our clients. And that means you start with the strategy, perhaps we're looking at a new customer, you do the brand identity, and then we, instead of just jumping into a guideline, uh, what's a better guideline than your communications? Mm -hmm. um, and I think our clients at the time were open to that. Can Collins do a video? Can Collins do advertising? And Chubb put a lot of trust in us for that, but I mean, I have a million things to talk about how much I love that project. Um, we vetted, I think, 75 unique case studies to get to those eight videos, the first round. Mm -hmm. um, my good, I'm gonna do my best to explain it all without breaking any non-disclosure agreements. Um, insurance is very sensitive. <laughs> my goodness, what a dream client, you know, everybody, wants to work on fashion and music and art galleries, um, which is all stuff I was really lucky to get to work on for a long time. Um, but I feel like you brought that aesthetic to insurance, oh, which, is, yeah. which is what was so striking about it is that you could, it felt like a high end art or fashion brand, even though it was an insurance brand. It just didn't have that. Um, I feel like in the consumer world, insurance so often has kind of a least common lowest common denominator kind mm -hmm. of look and feel or aesthetic or sense of humor and um but just has a, a more elevated overall tone well i i think you hit the nail on the head um you know brian and tom really led that biz id work and i was brought on to all the video work and like realizing all of that in motion not just graphic but film yeah. um, when we kicked off the advertising part of the assignment, we were looking at the category and this is where, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's either goofy and it's like doing a magic trick or um, doing puns um, in order to sell insurance or it's fear. Uh, fear is the other side of it, which is like, look at your house on fire. Call us. Um, Really, there's not much in between. Yeah, there's not much in the middle. No. And um, the CEO of Trump uh, requested that we do real customers, real stories, real testimonials. But, you know, they had to exist in anywhere between six to a dozen different languages. Hmm. Um, they required various cut downs. Um, and, you know, doing a real person and a real story, how do you make that? interesting what a dream assignment um we we set up an environment where after we had pre-screened and done our initial interviews we flew our customers out to a train factory in almost total darkness and they walked in and watched their lives play out on a 90 foot screen hmm. you know most people never get to see their lives play out in cinema especially at that scale yeah so to capture the emotion on their face um, and just, again, most people would never experience that. So to capture that emotion and hear their lines and eventually see it all cut together, very, very wonderful time to be alive working on those. How do you feel that your, um, maybe your experience in music video had you looking at how to do film and video oh. for them differently? Yeah, I would say, you know, um, I started making videos um, with my dad's camera, maybe in like 97 or something like that. Never, and recording my band, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, when I worked at Frank, we had so much great content in the book. 
but it was hard for those stories to live on um, beyond the book. And I think it was in like 2009 when I grabbed some of our interns and a single camera and we started making the first Frank videos, which were our short documentaries, natural extensions of uh, some of our content you would find in the book. And then doing it for Scion, then doing music videos. I mean, look, I think I made, before I worked here, I probably made about 300 videos. I would say that 12 of them are any good. <laughs> um, you know, the other ones did their job. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know how to work with a shot list. You know how to work with a cinematographer. Mm -hmm. You understand sound design. You understand the way music plays a role in telling the story. Um, you know, doing so many interviews and you know this, um, uh, more than anybody, um, you know how to record a real VO, uh, what sounds authentic and mm -hmm. what just kind of sounds like somebody's trying to emulate acting that they're interested in. Um, right. there's so many ways in to do that. And I mean, goodness, Chubb, that project that really encompassed everything. There was a, sh a short film playing within the film. There were, uh, there was set design. There was, uh, we had orchestras compose some of that music. We worked with world-class sound designers. Um, you know, I, I say to some of the designers here a lot and to anybody looking for advice, because a lot of people have asked me that. They're like, how did you get into video? Or was it hard? It's really just trial and error. And if you can make a poster or you can make an annual report, you can definitely make a video. Um, you know, imagery is photography is cinematography. Uh, yeah. Words on page are the script. Um, a, any possible, like that final articulation of a single image is your 30. It's just mm -hmm. applying um, sort of a different filter to understanding that. Yeah, that's great perspective. Um, yeah. So maybe, maybe every day is Chubb, maybe it's not, but what, what oh does a typical yeah. day look like for you? Like what, what does just day-to-day -day work at, at Collins look like? Mm -hmm. Well, Chubb is definitely one of my favorite clients. Again, working in insurance, nobody would believe this, but they're the most lovely people. Um, oh my goodness. Um, so I work on just about anything under the sun. We don't like to... Uh, pigeonhole ourselves. You know, you go to certain companies that are like, we do fashion and other people that we do beverage. Um, we don't discriminate. We are just interested in working with people who are as passionate as we are. Um, I would say on any given day, you might find me working, of course, on insurance or uh, working on a cannabis startup working on a Japanese entertainment company, working on a women's shoe company, working on an artificial, artificial intelligence company. I really get to touch it all. I'm very blessed. Um, and really, it's like sometimes it's research, sometimes it's strategy, sometimes it's working with designers, sometimes it's working with filmmakers, sometimes it's sitting in a booth and doing a VO recording session. Um, like I said, I'm very lucky to do all the different things I do here. Well, another really recent project I understand you worked on was, uh, was naturalizer, which oh, yeah. I have memories as a child going through the mall in the eighties with my mom and going into the naturalizer store. So yeah, tell, tell me about this brand. I mean, how did, how did you, um, and I feel like you, you pushed them to a really interesting, yeah. maybe push is the wrong word, but I, I think you, you've brought them to a really interesting point as well. So give us a little backstory on that. Yeah. So I'm going to package uh, all the new stuff up and send it to you. But I would say this is in 2016. Um, I think so, maybe the end of 2015. They approached us, Calaris, uh, Calaris, who we did the rebrand of, uh, prior called the Brown Shoe Company out of St. Louis. This is mm -hmm. a 40 year old business, one of the first vertically integrated businesses in America, really just an icon of westward expansion, the Brown Shoe Company. So we worked with them on their rebrand to Calaris. We became great partners uh, with them. We did, my goodness, Calaris, Naturalizer, Sam Edelman, Alan Edmonds, um, more case studies that you'll see appear on the site this year. Um, so they came to us and they said, you know, Naturalizer, the last time 
we were at peak relevancy was maybe the late 90s. So at that point, you know, almost 20 years ago. So a lot of the customers that they had acquired around that time um, were starting to potentially age out and they needed to attract some new customers. Mm -hmm. So we worked with our strategy team at identifying uh, some potential new customers that they could be speaking to. Um, we then, oh, this was so much fun. Uh, we went to their archives in St. Louis, which is maybe like a 20 by 20 square foot room. Um, it has photographs, newspaper clippings, anything you can imagine from uh, when Naturalizer launched in 1927 to mm -hmm. now. Yeah, cool. And we audited every document they had, everything the customer was looking for, just to see like historically what was relevant to them. In addition, uh, I went on Etsy and found that there was a massive aftermarket for Naturalizer shoes mm. from the 40s through the 70s. Insane. Um, shoes, shoe styles that they were not making uh, at that time. But some of them were selling for like $100 on mm. Etsy. Um, and just like you, I knew about Naturalizer because of my mom and growing up as a townie, seeing them in the mall. Um, so anyways, where that landed us was we did a product innovation workshop and we worked with all their product designers to show them, um, well, we, I think I purchased like 40 pairs of shoes on Etsy and handbags, all sorts of stuff. Um, we gave them an archetype, a woman named Claire McCardle in the... Uh, from the late 1930s and 1940s, who really embodied the spirit of Naturalizer at their best around that time. Mm -hmm. We brought in historians from the MAT and the Fashion Institute of Technology to do lectures with them. Uh, with Brian and many of my team members here, we did design workshops, all of which informed the new product that came out. Um, in parallel, we did their brand identity. And then just like I mentioned uh, to you about video before, the client approached us and said, hey, you guys get us. Do you want to do our store design? Um, so we designed Naturalizer's flagship stores in New York and Chicago. Uh, those just opened up about two weeks ago. It was surreal walking in. Uh, I had worked on you know, art installations, trade show booths, things like that. I had never really gotten to wrap my my head around a retail space. And I was so lucky to work with three geniuses here. Um, so when I walked in to shoot it for a case study, it was like stepping into the rendering. It was insane. Mm -hmm. They just paid attention to every detail. How cool is that? Um, yeah, th those products or those projects are very near, dear, near and dear to my heart, Naturalizer and Chubb. Um, again, it's like, we work with people all the time that that'll say like, Oh, I want to work on Spotify or I want to mm -hmm. work on Nike. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, like there's only so much transformation you can do there yeah. um, with something like Chubb or naturalizer. It's really just, you have clients with patience, trust, uh, imagination. You really can do anything. Um, and Do you think that clients, really yeah. identifies what it what it um, what makes for a great client at Collins, like that uh, trust and vision, and or or are there other things that feed into that? Uh, I mean, look, wh whether it's called design or branding or advertising or marketing, you're basically getting your money from a CMO or some kind of VP of marketing. People want to market something. Yeah. Um. And you, there's often those spaces in between where you're like, we want to go here. And that might be an uncomfortable conversation. Um, but if you have that patience and vision and trust, you know, sometimes that happens in two hours. Um, sometimes that happens after the first meeting, you know, five weeks later or something like yeah. that. But yeah, I think, I think it's really that. And obviously just like, clear transparent communication i mean it, that sounds pretty basic but uh there's no other way to define that yeah, yeah. It's Look, just, you have brian collins right here you want to say brian hi collins ladies and gentlemen Josh Miles. 
Josh. How are you, sir? Josh, I'm fabulous. How are you? There he is. Cameo this appearance. Guy, Love it. I was just saying so much nice stuff about him. Oh my God. That's great. <laughs> but my, my, my ears must have been ringing. I'm sorry. I'll let you. Are we, are we live? Well, we're recording. We'll be live soon right, enough. Okay, well, yes. then I'll step out because whatever, yeah. whatever I say will be nothing in comparison to the eloquence of my partner, Nick. <laughs> oh, my God. So, um, have you been? You good? I'm doing really well. Yeah, good to see you. You look FAB. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll have to get you back on the show at some point, too. No, get everybody else. If they're far more interesting things to say than I do, I'm going to let you go. I cool. do want to talk to my um, colleague really quickly. Peace, Brian Collins. Thank you, sir. Not bad cameo. Always a pleasure. Uh, so, um, so we were talking about trust and transparency. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? imagination. I, I I don't want to get you stuck on some kind of lofty strategic values. These are very real things that I'm happy to uh, identify with you. So, um, can I tell you? Let me take a spin at what it's not, right? Okay, sure. So are you familiar with the show Seinfeld? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, let's look at George Costanza as a potential client. So in many episodes of Seinfeld, George Costanza runs into Jerry's apartment and he's like, this woman's going to call you. You got to answer that I'm an architect, that I'm a banker, that I'm a philanthropist, whatever. And he starts the relationship off with a lie. And basically for the next 26 minutes runtime, everybody's trying to defend George's lie to which it never works. Um, Strangely. (laughs) He falls apart in the end, right? The pretty clear demonstration of George Costanza in that show. Yeah. Yeah. It's a a consistent story arc. (laughs) Yes. So uh, I think when you kick off a new relationship, whether that is a romantic relationship or a client relationship, you have to be clear and consistent about what your objective is. Um, With a client, it's like, okay, in one year's time, we're going to be changing, completely changing the face of this brand. What is everything we need to do in order to, I'm getting looks as we walk by. Okay. Um, (laughs) So uh, we're getting, uh, sorry, (laughs) to change the face of the brand. So then you can work back from that. What is everything we need in order to do that? What do meetings look like? What do approvals look like? If somebody came to me, any client, and said, hey, Nick, I just want to look amazing in front of my boss. I, this may never come out. Um, At least I would know that that is the intention and I could work with you to look yeah. amazing and potentially then that work would come out and see the world. But you have to be honest about those kind of things and you have to be clear about who is approving what, what does a real timeline look like? Um, there's so many clients, uh, not just here, this is all over the world. They're like, well, we need a signal change, so we're gonna change our logo. And they're like, okay, maybe. Maybe it's a communications issue. You know, maybe mm-hmm. you just need great new photography uh, and you need some new videos out in the world. Maybe you need to change the way you're spending your media dollars. Um, we're not that sort of company that's like, great, you want to change your logo? Let's go. Uh, <laughs> there has to be a reason for it. And um, shit, I just went on such a tirade. Um, <laughs> is all that uh, registering? Yeah, all that's good. Right. Um, so the one thing that I don't think I told you at the start of the show was when we chatted with Brian, we had a similar story arc where we had so much to talk about that we actually ended up doing a part two like a month later. Oh my so goodness. If you're up for that, maybe that would be a good fit for you as well. So just I mean, throwing if you're that still, like, Josh, if you still like me, because honestly, I can barely look at myself. <laughs> Oh goodness. Uh, somehow I doubt that. Um, but what about like, um, design heroes or people that you looked up to, especially early on in your career or maybe other, other people that you admire currently? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, geez, Brian Collins, number one. Uh, no, he was just been a, a great friend and partners for me. Um, I was really fortunate early in my career to meet Steve Heller. Um, and I, I really love that man. I love everything he's done. Um, started writing, started art directing Screw Magazine uh, in the early 70s. Became the art director for the New York Times Book Review. Became a writer. I think his first book was putting out um, collections of artists' Christmas cards. Uh, I read his his monograph on Paul Rand uh, before I met him. He accepted me into his program. Um, he's a hero of mine because I think he really validated what this profession was more, not just in the traditional design sense, but took people from history that would have been overlooked and found a way to make them permanent fixtures within the conversation. Um, yeah, I would say Steve is a big one for me. Yeah. Yeah. And he's since then written like 40,000 books or, I mean, the um, guy must not sleep. He's, he's incredible. Yeah. I think he's definitely at like 140 or 150. Yeah. Uh, I mean, him and Lita both, Lita Tallarico, who's his co-chair at MFA Design. Uh, those two people changed my life. You know, I took him alone and I paid for it, but they, uh, they changed my life. Wonderful people. They delivered on the brand promise at least. Yeah, look, I mean, for design heroes, you know, I could sit here and be like Herb Lubalin, right? <laughs> but like at the same time, like, I don't know Herb Lubalin. I know Steve Heller. I know Lita. I know Brian Collins. Those are heroes of mine. Pretty solid list. Yeah. All right. So um, before we, we wrap up episode one or part oh one, <laughs> we're getting close here. I got to ask you the question that I ask everybody who's ever been on the show, which is, um, sort of based on the name, uh, we, we designers, creatives are, are an obsessed bunch. So I'm curious what you find that you are most obsessed with right now. Mm. This is a very relevant question right now, because I would say I had gone through a span where perhaps I was obsessive, but I wasn't obsessed with one particular thing. Uh, is that fair? Yeah, totally. And about a year ago, my wife, Menica, love of my life, um, she got me a new turntable um, with three records. And I was like, girl, I just, no, I don't, I don't need a turntable again. Because like, I knew what, what that was going to bring. And she's like, well, yeah, I got you three records. We'll just keep a couple at the house. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm a nerd, okay? Like, if you open the box, I'm going to want the cables a certain way. I'm going to want very particular records. I'm going to want the furniture right. I'm going to want the speakers right. And it became a project. You know, a year later, I have one of the best um, uh, hi-fis you can imagine. And it's it's like a drug. Um you know, I said to her at the time, I was like, look, I have Apple Music and Spotify. Like, I don't, I don't need to own records again. <laughs> I hurt my back enough times trying to carry them. And I was like, okay, well, I'll have like top 20. And then, you know, I travel, I go to like Texas or LA or somewhere with just like great bins. New York, uh, I say. <laughs> Um, and I pick up like five records and then 20 became 50 and 50 became a hundred. Now I'm like scratching my face, getting out of work. I'm like, yeah, maybe I can go hit that. <laughs> work. Uh, you know, like last night I walked by a record store. I was like, let me just get one thing that I can put on to clean to. Um, and I bought Cerrito, which is like, um, I think I'm saying that right. It was like this woman that Stevie wonder produced, mm. um, in the mid seventies. She's often overlooked. Wonderful songwriter. Um, and then I spun it like four times last night while I chased my cat around and cleaned the house. And then I listened to it all morning. I'm pretty obsessed with it right now. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's about it. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, before we officially let you go, um, 
let our listeners know where they can track you down on the interwebs or oh, learn sure. more about the Nick Ace. Yeah, yeah. Um, I call it um, uh, uh, Access My Life, which is just like LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, email. Um, <laughs> so I think it's like LinkedIn.com slash Nick Ace. Um, Instagram.com slash Nick Ace, uh, Facebook.com slash Nick Ace. And my email is just Nick at wearecollins.com. You can find me on nickace.com. Uh, if you spot a sticker, ask somebody. There's still a ton out there. And maybe I'll do some hard time <laughs> this time. And now, really, again, look at me in my privilege um <laughs> my liberal arts degrees um no um yeah that's about it awesome nick we definitely need to do part two okay it's been a pleasure chatting with you and thank you for being obsessed with design thank you so much josh i uh i'm really grateful for the opportunity Okay, kids, that's show number 114 officially in the books. I hope you enjoyed our chat with Nick Ace. And if you didn't catch this earlier, we're also releasing a few of our recent interviews on YouTube. This one will be at youtube.com slash Josh Miles. As we expand our topics here at Obsessed Show, please tweet at Obsessed Show and let me know who else you think we should talk to. Do you want to hear from video people, from authors, from painters? What kind of creators and creatives and makers are most interesting to you? Because that's who I want to interview on this show. Don't forget to check out that new 59 Second Friday series all about personal branding and marketing on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Josh Miles. And it would mean a lot to me if you just hit that subscribe button. Every subscriber means a lot. You can get all of today's show notes on our website, still at obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. Obsessed Show got started on Solid Foods at Miles Herndon, a branding agency in beautiful downtown Indianapolis. Visit milesherndon.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.